you've come to the right place. If you're a course creator looking to build more impact, income, and freedom, LMS Cast is the number one podcast for course creators just like you. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co-founder of the most powerful tool for building, selling, and protecting engaging online courses called Lifter LMS. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. Today I'm joined by a special guest, Cheryl Gillahan from Cause Labs. Her mission is to accelerate yours if you're a nonprofit. Cheryl has also done some learning project creation inside of a nonprofit in Kenya, which uh, helps with work, workforce development for youth using Lifter LMS, which is super cool. We'll get into that later in the show. But first, I want to welcome you, Cheryl, for coming. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, Well, this is, I really want to get into serving the nonprofit sector because in course creation, um, people are are usually driven by one, two, or three things. The, The first one is income. The second one is impact. And the third is both of those things. Um, in the nonprofit sector, typically the impact is, you know, it takes the, uh, you know, like the main motivation, like a nonprofit has a mission. What's it like to do, to work in the nonprofit space and, and how is it different as an agency? Um, or what may, just, can you tell us, like, if somebody's thinking about getting into serving nonprofits, what's that like? Sure. Um, so we've been serving nonprofits for um, over 16 years now, and I have been a part of it since 2010. And so I don't think it's really too different other than the fact that you have to have a lot of empathy for the end user. So you're not just working with the business, you're working with the business and all of their program team and who they're actually serving on the ground. And especially when we're talking about technology, there are sometimes some unintended consequences. And so we have to be aware that what we build really can change these people's lives or can potentially ruin lives. And so we're just really careful about what we actually implement. Um, But it's a business just like any other business. And so I think that's the the thing that people get hung up on, like, oh, they don't have the budget or, oh, they won't want to pay for things. Oh, they rely solely on donations and charity. But the reality is that a nonprofit is a business as well. Um, They have a board, they make, you know, budgetary decisions. They have line item for, you know, their technology or for their consulting services. Um, And so understanding that and those dynamics and knowing essentially when they're going to be creating their budgets Um, so that you can be having those conversations with them beforehand and anticipating that that uh, business cycle is just a little bit longer. Um, I think that's the one thing that the people should be aware of. That's awesome. And can you name some of the nonprofits that maybe you've worked with that might be household names that people might've heard of before? Um, Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Um, Let's see, household names, Follett Education, Um, IDEO.org potentially. Um, And we've worked with Lego Education. So, of course, they're a for-profit company, but a household name, but they do have sort of an education branch that we've worked with on strategy and products. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned strategy before we were chatting about human-centered design, and that really piqued my curiosity. If you're, you know, talking to a client and you're going into the strategy of you know, should we build this? Should we not? How much is it going to cost? And you slow down the conversation and get into human centered design. What are we unpacking there? So human centered design is a process that we actually learned when we started partnering with IDEO.org. Um, and in that design thinking process, it's, you know, it's very much like the scientific method. So everybody learned how to do this in fourth grade. They just don't necessarily apply it to every single problem that they are having business problem, program development and design problem. Um, But if you take that method and you apply it to any problem that you have and you apply critical thinking and testing your assumptions, um, you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Somebody comes to us, they say, this is what we want. How much would you bid on this? 
Um, and sometimes it's a, okay, this is what we would bid, but this is our process and this is what it would look like. And we may not actually need to build what you're asking to build. Um, when we're talking about technology, especially if we're talking about custom web apps or custom platforms and integrations, um, it can be very costly. And so when you're looking at a large sum of money, you don't want to build something that's not actually going to make a difference, especially if you're talking about the nonprofit social impact, social enterprise space. You want to make sure that the beneficiaries that they're trying to serve actually are served. Um, one example is that back when we were building mobile apps, um, a client wanted to build both Android and iOS apps and said it needed to be also a Windows phone app. Well, nobody wants to build a Windows phone app anymore <laughs> these days. Um, but it turns out that the majority of the market that they were serving couldn't even afford iPhone apps or iPhones. And yeah. so they really only needed to build an Android app to serve their market. And so that just helps us assess at the very beginning before we start building the project um, what is really needed here um, and how is this really going to serve the audience that is awesome what how do nonprofits leverage technology or like how do they like what purpose what what problems what jobs to be done does cause labs come in there and help with i mean there's the message but what else um that is a huge question yeah. because there are a lot of things. And this is why I feel like we maybe fail at marketing yeah. is because when you say you do all the things, you do nothing yeah. <laughs> and people need to hear very specifically what that thing is that will help them. Um, which is why I've gotten good at storytelling is because it helps people to understand what we've done in the past and how we've helped organizations. Well, tell um, us a story. Sure. I'll tell you a story. Um, so one organization that came to us was actually, um, they had a phenomenal grant working with Bill and Melinda Gates foundation, um, to essentially, um, do output based aid in Vietnam and they were trying to get 10,000 latrines into homes. And so the individuals in these rural provinces in Vietnam um, were working with the women's union, getting supplies and they were building their own latrines. And once it's inspected, then it, they'll actually get repaid. And so now they have a free latrine in their home to help their family for generations. Um, and so, they were carrying around binders of paper, you know, on their motorbikes. Sometimes papers would get lost. Sometimes it would rain and they would be, you know, illegible and not usable or, you know, human error comes into play when you're, you know, looking at a sheet with hundreds of numbers on it and you write the inspection notes on the wrong line um, or, you know, you miss a box and you don't check something off. And so that person doesn't get reimbursed for their work. Um, we built an Android app for them that actually allowed them to go into the field with just the tablet. Um, it, you know, they would search for the number of the home. It would show them the required fields so they wouldn't miss any. They'd take a picture with the phone of the actual latrine installation. Um, and that would, that record, when they got back to the office and they had Wi-Fi, would automatically sync to the database. So there's no data entry at that point. So it's helping them save time. It's helping them with their data management as far as the quality of the data that they're collecting. And it just allowed people to get reimbursed a lot faster because it optimized that process so much. Wow, I love that story. And that's probably not what the client came in asking for, I'm imagining. You helped them figure out, like, there, so there's some strategy in figuring out what are we doing here, right? So in this particular instance, I'm not sure what the actual problem statement was, but when we're referred to a client, um, they usually don't know what they need to build yet. Um, when we're referred to them, they have a slew of problems. And the question is, we've got this budget, we just got this grant, how can we utilize that grant to help this program deliver better um, and impact more people? And so, Fortunately, we sort of start at that front end of like helping them even design that concept. And that's where a lot of our strategy comes in. That is awesome. As a CEO, how else do you use storytelling? And I think you're muted. I'm not sure if, uh, there you go. Um, 
you know, I, I use storytelling to share our work, but then I use storytelling to share a lot of other people's work as well. And I use it as sort of that cautionary measure, like the one I just told you about not building an iPhone app because your users only have Androids. And that's one of those stories that I can share. We've actually experienced that. But when I hear other people tell stories, I also like to share those. Um, and that helps me sort of gain perspective on the work that we're doing. And I think it helps other people sort of gain perspective on um, the problems that we're facing in the world and the challenges that we're having. Um, one story that um, Amina Mohammed shared when I was at an international development conference, she shared that, you know, it's great that we're building wells and that we're helping communities get clean water. Um, but if we're not involving the community in that decision and we're not helping them to um, do essentially that, that change management of like their culture and society, um, they're not going to drink that water. And one of the villages that they actually visited um, had this perfectly amazing well that had clean water. And a year later, they went and visited and nobody was drinking the water and they were all drinking out of the river, which is disgusting and red and like it's clearly not clean. And when they asked the question, why aren't you drinking water out of the well? They said, well, the government helped put that well in there and it doesn't look like the water that we drink. Why would we drink that? And so, you know, creating that trust in the solution and that the solution is actually meant for them um, to serve them and to help them. I think it's, it's really important. So it's not enough to just build the tool or to implement a well or to implement change. You actually have to engage the community and why this change is being implemented. Um, and they have to want it and they have to desire it and it has to really be solving a problem for them, not a perceived problem that we perceive, um, but a problem that they're actually feeling. I love that. The way, the way I describe that is uh, so, like sometimes in, in the learning space, we, we serve our customer, but we also are serving our customer's customer. So we have to think about the end user, the learner, whoever is going to be, because there, there's many stakeholders. It's not always just the person buying the website or building the website or the owner of the company that's involved or the nonprofit. What's, what's the public benefit corporation that um, you guys are a part of or participate in some way? What is that? Yes. So when we acquired the company last year, a year ago today, actually, Happy um, birthday. We, thank you. We formed yeah. as a public benefit corporation and it was really important to Michael and I to really live out our values in everything that we do with the company. So this um, is like a, you could be an LLC or an S corp. This is like one of those types of things. Yes. Okay. So what, exactly. what, is it, what is it? So it depends on your state on whether they actually allow the public benefit corporation entity. Um, I believe that there are 33 or 34 states um, that are on board with that now. Um, before we were a public benefit corporation, we were actually a certified B Corp through B Lab. So we have a third party audit, actually audit our company every two to three years to see that we're um, upholding the measures that we're saying about our environmental and social sustainability. But by becoming a public benefit corporation, we're actually saying that um, when we make decisions as a company, we're taking into account um, all of our stakeholders, not just shareholders, but also our community, our workers, um, the beneficiaries of the work that we produce. And so making sure that you know, we're making that positive impact, which is actually our mission is to create positive impact, um, that we're making that impact in every decision that we make. So for example, um, we're about to have an anniversary party tonight for the one year anniversary of the company. And even our decisions and um, what kind of paper plates do we purchase and what kind of cups and what kind of silverware, you know, buying plant-based plastics that we can compost and, um, you know, making sure that we make decisions about when do we print, when do we not print, you know, our, our environmental sustainability, um, are we using green power um, and every sort of decision that we make, even with, um, for example, transportation is a big part of our company because um, it's, a, it's a large part of our footprint because we are a distributed team. And 
for the most part, we have global clients, and so we travel to them. And so one of the initiatives that we've taken on is that we're going to buy carbon offsets to offset some of our travel and some of our footprints. Um, we're not at the point where we can be, you know, zero waste, zero carbon footprint, but we're trying to make a bigger impact every single year. That's awesome. Um, I had a question for you related to what you just said, which is, let's imagine whether you're building sites for clients or like us, we're a software company or you're a course creator and things are, things are going well and you want to give back and you believe in things like sustainability and certain causes. What, how does somebody or a company or more of a for-profit company kind of get into that world? I've always been inspired by, you know, like Patagonia does the 1% for the planet or the Tom shoes, buy one, give one kind of concept. But what are, how do people kind of, if they're new to it, get into uh, making sure their dollars that, that are going to nonprofits and causes, how to, like, where should they start? It's, it's a little bit overwhelming when you look across the landscape of all these uh, nonprofits out there. How, how do, yeah. how would you, what would you say? Start little by little, you know, um, essentially gain some awareness of the, the things that you can do. And I think that the initial thing that we did is we took an audit of how do we consume things? What are we consuming? And as a tech company, some of the things that we're consuming are like um, servers, hosting. you know, the energy yeah. and hosting that, you know, the energy that's actually uh, being generated there. And so choosing a green host or at least a host that is moving in the direction of becoming greener, um, I think is really important. Um, another thing is, you know, how do you take care of your people and your team? Um, and, and what are the things that matter there? Because, and also how do you communicate with them the decisions and choices that the company is making? It's really important to me that I'm sharing with the team that we're using green products or that we are trying to, you know, buy carbon offsets or reduce our footprints. And if they can make small shifts, even within their own home, you know, everything that we buy and the power that we have as consumers is tremendous. Everything that we do as consumers really impacts our economy and impacts our environment. And so everything down to where are you banking and who are you getting your loans from and how are they spending your money um, is just really important to think about. And I don't think that we recognize how much value our dollar has. Um, but if you start to think about the things that you're purchasing and and how that money is being used and what the supply chain is, even of the companies that we're shopping with, um, makes a difference. That's awesome. I've always liked the, um, the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. So when you're making a decision, I love that you mentioned the people because the planet, yes, is very important, but also the human beings that work with you or um, are your customers or whatever, like how people experience um, their life is, is really important. So, uh, can you talk to us about diversity in, in like a team and like in hiring as an example, or just in having a diverse team, like what that means, why that's important. How do we approach that in these times? Yeah. So I've had some really interesting conversations lately. Um, there's, you know, the idea that diversity means that you have to check off the box that, you know, I, I have one woman and I have one person of color and I have one veteran. And thankfully for my team, I'm a woman person of color and a veteran. So my whole team check, just check, like checks, check. off, <laughs> checks off the box right there. Yeah, yeah. Like Cheryl checks all our boxes. So we're all good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, that's just not how it works. I mean, diversity comes into play in a lot of different ways. And sometimes that is, you know, the way that somebody grew up or, you know, our economic status or, um, our age or just the experiences that we've had and making sure that when we're hiring, um, that we're aware of these things enough that, you know, it's not like, oh, well, you haven't had these experiences, so I'm not going to hire you. It's more of getting to know the whole person and understanding that the experience, the experiences they've had so that when we have team discussions, um, we're able to bring our whole selves and we can have um, really uh, valuable discussions about 
how we function as a company, how we function as a team, how we do things better, how we innovate together, um, and how we create things. And so I think that, especially from a problem solving perspective, when we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we serve this really challenging issue that, you know, our clients' clients are facing, um, we have to come at it from all perspectives. And we have to recognize that if this challenge that could potentially be a global challenge hasn't been solved yet, it's not because all the smartest people haven't been in the room together. All the smartest people in the world have been in the room together, but maybe all the smartest people were not the right people to tackle that challenge. You know, maybe we needed people who, you know, have different experiences and different backgrounds and different things to bring to the table. Um, and so just recognizing that everybody brings value to a conversation and everybody brings value to um, the problem solving discussion is just really crucial for our team. Keep listening. This podcast is not over. This is just a special message about this episode's sponsor, WP Tonic Managed WordPress LMS Hosting. Think of it as everything you need to have a professional online course training platform right out of the box, ready to go. Find out more about WP Tonic's Managed WordPress LMS Hosting by going to lifterlikes.com forward slash tonic. Now back to the show. One of your superpowers is that you love people. And I believe that um, sometimes as an agency or if you're a course creator, your customer and your clients, if you're not like in love with them, just like you need to love your people, like that passion, if that's not there, if they're just kind of a means to an end or you're just kind of mailing it in, it's, it's so much harder. How, how do you kind of, uh, how does, you know, loving people, being a, someone who really enjoys the company of others and can appreciate their diversity and um, just have a really strong strength and empathy, what, what does that do for you? What does that unlock and um, how has it served you? I think you mentioned it right there. Empathy has been really important in the work that we do. Um, and it's probably important for anybody's work. Um, but, you know, how, do, how has it really made a difference? I think that every project that every agency tackles, maybe not every project, but a lot of projects, they hit this point where you have a hurdle that you have to cross or you have to have a challenging conversation with a client or um, you have to have a challenging conversation with a team member potentially um, and being able to come into that with empathy for the other person as well as you know just caring for that person and loving that person I think is just really important and recognizing that they're coming from a point of they want the best as well, and they have good intentions. Um, so if you're talking about a client, for example, and you have to have a really challenging conversation about, oh, well, we've gone over budget, or that is out of scope, or some of these other conversations that we've had as agencies, um, recognizing that they're going to push for everything that they can because they're serving the greater good. Um, if you're talking about the nonprofit space, especially, um, they're serving the greater good. And I also want to serve the greater good and I want to help them as much as I can. Um, but we also are taking care of our people and trying to take care of the planet and are making certain decisions. And, you know, that, that third word that you mentioned with, you know, planet people and profit, that third word is profit. And we have to sustain as a business if we want to continue helping people. Um, recognizing also that they have to sustain as a business if they want to keep helping people. Um, and so just coming at it from that perspective of understanding and knowing that we both want the same thing really helps. That's awesome. Well, I wanted to shift gears and talk about a project you did recently with Lifter LMS uh, for, a, I believe, a nonprofit in Kenya that helped with youth workforce development. Can you tell us about it? Yes, so Toolkit iSkills is a new partner of ours. They were previously the Toolkit Institute. Um, we helped them with a website redesign, and when we first started talking with them, they had 
big dreams of everything that they wanted to be able to do. Um, and one of those dreams is we want to reach more youth and we think that we can do that if we take our courses online. And I said, okay, we can absolutely do that. I have a great partner that we can actually work with and mentioned Lifter LMS and we reached out to you and, and asked whether or not that would be a potential fit. And, um, turns out it's actually serving them very well. They uh, are working in Kenya specifically right now. And what they have been doing is actually doing on-site workshops. And so every time they're training these youth who, um, these are typically uh, high school dropouts that don't have a degree and um, they're underserved and in poverty and in order to get themselves out of poverty they have to gain a skill of some sort and so toolkit eye skills is actually helping them in the skills of like plumbing and welding painting scaffolding tiling electrician um, and flooring and, and some of those other skills like masonry and things like that um, one of the audiences that they serve that really surprised me because these are typically male roles is they serve a lot of women and so uh, they are giving these women the ability to do things that they didn't think that they should be doing or could be doing. And they're giving them a skill that actually helps them get out of poverty. But the way that they were delivering their courses, the women might have to travel pretty far to get to a workshop. So opening this up online and actually giving them a tool where they can deliver it to anyone anywhere um, allows them to expand their reach. They're still doing the on-site workshops and they're still doing training one-on-one -on -one with people, um, but it gives them the ability to put their entry-level courses online to get people interested in this, to get them aware of what Toolkit iSkills is doing um, and just get them involved in the community until they can actually get to the point where they, they have enough skills to, to do an on-site workshop potentially with one of the manufacturers that is, is providing um, jobs for them wow that's really neat so how do they make the course do they film the on-site training or they make something different at, on at a different location like how do they uh get the content they're actually still figuring that out so yeah. they've been um putting up pdf content text content they have some video yeah. um, but a lot of their content right now is you know images and and documents and um, security checklists and safety checklists. Yeah. Um, and they're just doing everything that they can to translate their content into what it needs to be. Um, ideally, they would like all of it to be video-based. They believe that their audience is going to respond a lot better to that, but they started with what they had. And yeah. so this is kind of a lesson for um, anybody that wants to approach an MVP, especially in course creation, creation, start with what you have and just get it out there and allow your audience and your students and those who are benefiting from it to tell you what they would like, um, how it could be better. Um, and they have just been iterating and improving and because that they can actually create the courses themselves, they can go in there and change it at any point in time and modify it how it needs to be. That's awesome. Can you speak a little bit more to the um, the impact on women in terms of like, let's say traditionally you were saying the, the trade skills like plumbing and masonry and whatnot. Um, is this something where um, just the just having the, the in-person workshops, but also the online training to get them ready helps uh, with bringing women into roles that they weren't necessarily in before in this country? So I think what helps, especially having their redesigned website and having the courses on there, and they expose a lot of pictures of the women who have gone through their courses. Um, and it's a woman owned organization as well. And I think okay. that helps. Um, but I think what helps is for other women to see the testimonials and they've got a few testimonials on their website to see other women in those positions actually thriving and succeeding and essentially changing the trajectory of their life as well as future generations that come after them right and so seeing that and realizing i can do this too um, and having the courses readily available for them for free for the entry-level courses and online um, all they need is is access um, and so you know i think that's that's a different hurdle and a different thing that they're going to try to tackle but right now it's just giving them the ability to act to to have those courses online do you know if uh, 
like in terms of at least it, let's say in Kenya, in terms of access to the internet, um, or is there like what's the status of like well mobile phone? They're skipping the personal computer and going to the mobile phone, or we're lo- working in kind of like computer lab, community computer lab situations. Do you know happen to know for that use case, like what's what people have in terms of options of accessing the internet? Or what else have you seen in some of your other projects? Yeah, I think it varies based on location. Um, and it also varies based on uh, who you are and why you're trying to access the internet. Um, just another story to share. Um, when I went to India, they said, oh yes, every, every city um, has an internet cafe. And so we have internet here. And I think there was a little bit of pride that, of course, we have internet here. Right. You know, every city has internet. Um, And so they wouldn't tell us that they couldn't use the internet cafe. It had, they have an internet cafe, but they wouldn't use the internet cafe. Um, And the reason is because nefarious things happen in the internet cafe. Apparently people watch a lot of porn. (laughs) So I was like, oh, so depending on who you are and whether or not you want to be associated with that, um, you, you might not use and, and be able to access in the locations that are supposedly there for you to better yourselves. Um, and so just recognizing that, you know, there is some stigma sometimes, even when technically um, access is there, it may not really be available or it may not be something that they want to associate themselves with. And so understanding the community, understanding what their actual needs are and setting up an infrastructure in the regions where you want to work, I think is really important because it varies. Like I said, sometimes um, they only have the SMS based functionalities, you know, they don't necessarily have a smartphone. And so understanding how that works. Um, Another project that we did, we realized that they were charged for every single um, phone call that they made. Mm -hmm. if the other line picks up and so we we did something that's called flashing first thing i'd first time i'd ever heard of it and it is you um they you allow them to call they hang up before it picks up on the other end and you call that number back and so the charges are on the caller um and so that that saves your your community the the need to actually pay for that call Wow. So just really digging in and understanding what, what are the barriers to actual access? Is it, is it cost? Is it, you know, the cost of data? Is the cost of, you know, having a device? Is it uh, location? Um, because it's different in every single area. I love the quote that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And sometimes, especially if we work in technology or we have good internet where we live or whatever, we kind of take it for granted. And it's not always the case, even in the United States. I, I think the statistic is like, um, I believe it might be 10% of the United States is not even online. Um, there's all these assumptions we have about equal access that aren't actually true, even in your own country and even in your own town. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And all, and you mentioned also with the, the Kenya site that, uh, they were doing a lot of text and uh, PDFs and checklists and things like that. Sometimes in rural areas, uh, the bandwidth or the ability for the website, like not having video can actually be a good thing or at least supplementing your video with these other things because if the video can't load or whatever, that other stuff can load over a slower internet connection, cellular internet and not be a problem at all. Whereas video and audio can kind of become a data hog or whatever. Yes, that's true. Um, And so I think having the multiple um, avenues is really important. However, you know, from a literacy perspective, um, text is not always the best medium um, Mm -hmm. for some of these regions that they're trying to reach. And so if literacy is a consideration, then video and audio is really helpful. And so just making those compressed and small enough that they can be delivered in a way that they can load is important. That's awesome. Well, I want to go back to your tagline because I, I really like it <laughs> as, a, as a marketing person and as a mission-driven entrepreneur myself. You, so on your homepage, it says, our mission is to accelerate yours. And um, 
I guess using that the uh, the workforce development example, um, so their mission was to for workforce development for um, primarily men and women who have dropped out of high school, who Correct. before the, before they become, or just to give them job skills or like what's the net, like what are you fighting against there and what's the opportunity? Just like, to give them job skills so that they can get out of poverty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that. and as far as you know, accelerating their mission, it it's both you know reaching more people, as well as reaching more people more quickly, um, as well as providing a tool that can reach people in different mediums and different ways. We were just talking about you know accessibility and literacy, and um, it just opens a lot of doors for them. Um, and it, as well as, you know, they are now partnered with Habitat for Humanity, who is funding some of their work um, because they've got this portal, essentially, that can bring everybody together. And so it's not just the training of the artisans. It's also providing um, not just the job skills, but opportunities for jobs. So people are actually coming to Toolkit iSkills asking if their artisans are available for, for work. Wow, that's a that's a lot right there. Well, just kind of, I don't want to keep you from your birthday party. So I have just like kind of one more question before we kind of wrap up the interview, which is, um, and you can answer this with a story or go high level with uh, more of a philosophy or whatever. But um, when you look at education or learning, what does it have the ability to do? It's kind of a really meta human skill that is, it's been a part of what makes us human for a long time. But if somebody wants to solve problems with education or work on an issue with education or learning or training or whatever you want to call it, what does it have the power to do? And uh, maybe share a story or if, or go high level of like how you see learning in the, the process of, you know, improving the world. Education is one of those things that can change somebody's life. So I won't go into a long story, but um, I was actually raised in poverty. And when I came to the United States, became an American citizen and um, had public education available to me. So it wasn't even private, specialized, you know, high level education. It was just public education available to me. My whole life changed. So if you read a little bit about my bio and my background and where I came from, a lot of my poverty story, I didn't learn until I was in my thirties. Um, but I recognize now in the work that I do that I was always meant to do this work and that I came from a place that I could be like my mother when she was in her thirties, you know, about to have a daughter selling bananas and trying to figure out how to get clean water and getting $3 a week from a, an agency that was sponsoring, sponsoring me so that I could get food. Um, and so education allowed me to be what I am today, allowed me to be where I am today. And part of that is hard work, but part of it's also luck. I got lucky. You know, I got the birth lottery in, in a sense and was able to come to a country that, you know, valued education and giving everyone education. I don't think that everyone is getting quality education. I don't think we're even equally um, provided what we should be provided. However, I think that there are a lot of organizations that are trying to help in that respect. And that's why we have a lot of education nonprofits um, and it's phenomenal. And they're tackling it in a lot of different ways because sometimes it's, you know, our learning abilities. Sometimes it's that some need just a little bit more help. Um, and sometimes it's that they're in a region where they don't have, you know, quality curriculum or the right tools. I like to look at it from a perspective of how is technology helping in the education space? I think that there are a lot of researchers that are trying to figure out how do we deliver education better um, at all the various age groups. Um, and the one thing that I think technology really helps with, especially as we sort of evolve and get into AI, we have all this data around education. Um, we have all these metrics and we're testing all our students all the time. Um, so we've got all these numbers. How do we utilize that to 
to do more personalized education and help them in the ways that they really need help for. Um, and I don't think personalized necessarily is always just one to one. I think there are, you know, ways that we can say, okay, this group of students really excels in this area, but they really need help over here. And just tailor, I think that technology allows us to tailor what we can offer um, as educators. But I also think that the world is our oyster at this point, and there's so much education available that for someone that's older, like myself, and not necessarily in primary school anymore, we can go out and learn anything that we want to. Um, and a lot of it is accessible and free um, and just online. And I think that's a huge benefit to anybody that is a lifelong learner. Cheryl Gillahan, she's at Cause Labs. You can find her at causelabs.com. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you sharing your experience, your insights, and your story. Uh, it's been great. Thank you so much. We're so grateful to Lifter LMS and what they've allowed us to do with Toolkit iSkills and um, future clients. Thank you. You've come to the right place. If you're a course creator looking to build more impact, income, and freedom, LMS Cast is the number one podcast for course creators just like you. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co founder of the most powerful tool for building, selling, and protecting engaging online courses called Lifter LMS. Enjoy the show.